lose that much. Go. Willie, take your little drum, Robin, bring your flute and come. On these instruments we'll play. Tor Lorlu, pat a pat a pen. On these instruments we'll play on this joyous Christmas day. Now, so have a seat. Sort of stand here from the side for just a minute. Okay, just stand real quietly. The choir's going to come. Here.
This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And thank you, children, for coming in and singing and helping us get ready for worship. We're always glad that we're going to hear your voices on a Sunday morning. We're grateful for that. And grateful for your presence here, whether you're a member of the church or visiting with us. We are uh, glad you're here and hope you'll sign the friendship pad as it makes its way back and forth along the pew. Uh, if you are uh, sitting near someone that you don't know, we hope that you'll take an opportunity to greet one another. Uh, maybe get to know one another, and you can use that uh, friendship sheet kind of as a, a way to put names and faces together, but we are glad that you're here. You may not uh, know the difference, but I want to say a special word of thanks. The, the back couple rows of the choir can know a difference because we had a group here yesterday while the young people were out there distributing Christmas trees and wreaths. We had uh, a group of people in here sponsored by the FIDE Sunday School class building a couple of risers for the back row of the choir so that they're not completely lost back there. Um, so we're, we're, we're glad, and, and we're glad it, it's, it's stable. I've walked on it. Uh, we had good, uh, had engineers here working on it. So, uh, but we're, we're, we appreciate uh, uh, the FIDES class making that possible and the uh, very good uh, carpentry crew that was here yesterday. Uh, we're uh, grateful for the variety of ways people use their gifts around here. Uh, take a minute, if you look at the back of the bulletin, you can see the various things going on in the life of the church uh, today and this week. Uh, this afternoon, this evening, is one of the wonderful traditions of our church family, the Christmas pageant. That will begin this afternoon at 5 o'clock. You see at 3.30, the chapel choir and the main characters in the uh, pageant will meet to go over all the uh, coming and going and the uh, choreography for that. Following the pageant, we'll uh, stay in this room and gather for a time of reception and uh, fun and festivity. And uh, it's, uh, we're, we're glad to have this great tradition continuing, even though we're somewhat displaced from our sanctuary, this uh, memorial hall has served the purpose very well. And then a reminder to newly elected elders and deacons that we have our final officer training meeting this evening at 7 o'clock over in the stock building. As you move down the page, uh, I have been asked to announce that uh, uh, while uh, we all know that college basketball is up and running, our own basketball programs are getting off to a good start. The middle school basketball team practices on Thursday nights here, and the high school team practices at 7.30. Our games will begin the uh, 7th of January. This is for uh, boys and girls, young men, young women, uh, and our own church members who are on these teams are encouraged to, uh, to invite their friends to join them, whether they're church members or not. Uh, this is a, a, a really wonderful activity uh, for the life of our church, and so I uh, hope uh, we're looking forward to, to good years ahead for these uh, basketball teams. Whether your college team is doing well or not, you, we can all uh, take pride in our um, middle and high school basketball teams. Various uh, church school class parties are going on this time of the year. Uh, uh, lots of festivities going on. An important thing we're gonna do starting next Sunday is uh, uh, make the life of a, some local homeless families better and maybe experience some Christmas cheer as next Sunday begins yet another week for us to be the host church for the Wake Interfaith Hospitality Network. Uh, this requires a lot of volunteers, a lot of effort, a lot of classes uh, coming together. We appreciate all that. If you'd like to know of ways that you can be involved, get in touch with us in the church office and we can let you know how to be involved in, the, in this WIN project. As we look ahead to the, uh, I, I know these have been printed in First Press, but I wonder as you make your plans for the holidays r to remind you, this is one of those unusual years when Christmas Day lands on a Sunday. That will not change our Christmas Eve schedule. We'll still have our traditional three different services on Christmas Eve, but on Sunday morning, Christmas Day, we will have an abbreviated uh, schedule, one worship service, a 10 o'clock worship service, uh, no scheduled church school classes, but the hope is that we'll come together on Sunday morning, Christmas Day, maybe after some of the frenzy that might go on in some of your homes uh, is long since over, uh, and we can worship together, uh, sing some of the carols of the season together, be reminded of the story that unites us, and so uh, we will look forward to, do, uh, to, to that uh, taking place. That, so that's the Christmas Eve and Christmas morning schedule for Sunday. A reminder to, to uh, you've had a great outpouring during November for our FPC shares. 
the FPC shares item for uh, the month of December uh, is soup. Some of you have already told me you're cold in here this morning, so think soup. Soup would be a good thing to, uh, 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 to, to have for lunch today, and the same thing will be for those who depend on our food pantries. And so we encourage you to remember those who depend on those pantries uh, as you do your Christmas shopping during the month of December. Again, we're glad you're here worshiping with us as we uh, gather together during the second Sunday of Advent. Uh, we invite you to continue worshiping with us throughout this season as we have special worship services coming up in the weeks ahead. And again, particularly grateful that the children are here singing with us today. But I invite you to continue to prepare yourself for this time of worship uh, during the time of the prelude. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light the light of the Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord shall be upon you. Hear now the words of the prophet Malachi. Malachi 3, 1 through 2. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Today we light the second candle of Advent and remember God's messenger, John the Baptist, and how he calls each of us to prepare our hearts and lives for Christ's coming. <laughs>
Advent is a season of preparation and penitence, a time when we prepare for Christ's coming. Let us confess our sin before God and one another, praying together the prayer of confession. We confess, O oh God, that we rather focus on the sin we see in others than on the sin that plagues us. Convinced of our own relative righteousness, we see the need for repentance in almost everyone, but not in ourselves. But John confronts us all, challenging us to prepare for Jesus' arrival by making changes, turning around, acknowledging our need for the forgiveness he brings. We find Jesus abrasive and confrontational but we also know that he's right. Help us to see the truth about ourselves so that we might fully embrace the truth of the gospel, your gift to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. coming changed the world. Through him we have the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. Thanks be to God. some members of the uh, Permar family here. Sally's uh, maintained her uh, membership here all along and she has moved back now to work at, uh, at Duke Pediatrics as associate professor in the Duke School of Medicine. And she brought with her a real Dukie who graduated in 1998, Matt Farragudo, her husband. In his undergrad days, Gordon, he once camped out 52 days in Krzyzewskiville. After graduation, uh, Matt moved to Boston, eventually getting a job with somebody else you've heard of, Ted Kennedy, as Deputy Press Secretary. It was in Boston that he and Sally actually met, although their paths had crossed, it would have seemed, many times before. They finally met at Fenway. They had actually run in the same marathon a couple years before, didn't see each other that day. After working in the nonprofit world for a while, Matt is now working down the street for a marketing agency. He's the social media director for Eckel and Vaughn, a firm that has another famous employee, Amy McLeod. Well, Matt and Sally have gotten in, very involved in the life of the church already. Just last month, they hosted dinner for the ninth graders. Both their kids were baptized. Sam was baptized here in 2009 and Kinsey earlier this year. 
So Matt Farragudo with his father-in-law and now officially his elder, uh, Dave Permar. So we're glad to have Matt and hope you'll uh, welcome him after the service. And I was glad I got to say Duke so many times. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. I'm Carol Ann Mooring, Director of Community Outreach here at First Presbyterian. My main responsibility is administering the Friendship Fund. As many of you know, this ministry was established 52 years ago, and our mission is to help the working poor of our community who are at risk. All the funding of the Friendship Fund is outside our church budget. As you can imagine, we are seeing many unemployed individuals this year and people who have never had to seek help before. Many are overwhelmed with their situation and the system of getting help. The current economic climate has affected us all. My family is eating out less. We keep the thermostat a little lower in the winter and a little higher in the summer. However, we have not had to make the tough choices our clients make every day between rent or water, food or heat. Through the 11 months ended last week, we saw a record 737 clients and helped 90% of those we saw. We have paid out 95,000 through 1130 for an average of about 150 per client. We received in donations during this period 40,000. Historically, we receive about 30,000 in December. As I have said many times before, we are able to continue paying out in excess of what is received because of a generous reserve that was built up during Carol O'Brien's tenure. These last few years have caused us to dip repeatedly into these reserves. We obviously cannot continue to do this. In this coming year, we will start limiting the clients we see because of our funding. I have never had to do this before. I have always limited the number of clients based on the volunteers available. We continue to help couples who struggle from paycheck to paycheck, retirees living on a flat income with rising expenses, grandparents raising grandchildren, single parents recently unemployed, battling a disease, or coping with a pay cut. Many of us, most of us, have many, if not too many, things. I'm asking you to consider giving a less tangible but more lasting gift this year. By giving to the Friendship Fund, you will be helping a family avoid eviction or a neighbor in Wake County keep their lights, gas, or water on. All donations to the Friendship Fund go directly to help clients. You received a form like this in a recent first press. Additional copies are in, are in the hallway. You simply fill out the form and return it to the church office with your check. A Christmas card will be sent to the individual you are honoring or the family of the one you are remembering. What a wonderful way to honor a Sunday school teacher, circle leader, friend, relative, or the memory of a loved one. Thank you for your continued support of this ministry. If you're a new member here, the, the Friendship Fund is our signature ministry here at First Presbyterian, and, and those of us in the office get calls every week from people who said, I've been trying to call that number to get an appointment for two months, and the line is always busy, and now me and my kids are going to be on the street. What can we do? So Carol Ann would rather be seeing more than fewer. Speaking of new Presbyterians, our most newest one is um, Harriet May Dryden, born very early yesterday morning at Rex, Kate and Paul Dryden's uh, first child, Harriet May Dryden. Of course, we welcomed Matt just a moment ago. Among our old Presbyterians, uh, Neil Beatty is at home. He had some surgery this week, and it's taken him a little longer to recover this time. He didn't want me to say he didn't want visitors, but it might be better to wait a couple days until he gets a little stronger. Susan Johnson, the missing Advent wreath lighter, is at home nursing her thumb. She got this nasty infection in the thumb, had to be hospitalized for two days, and is finishing the antibiotics at home this week. Vicki Pierce had a surgical procedure this week and has a long recovery at home. Terry Beckham had a bad reaction to some new medication. She had to be hospitalized for a couple days, but is doing better now. And Hazel Horner took her last antibiotic yesterday. She finally thinks she's over the bronchitis and hopes to be sitting up here in two weeks for the great uh, Christmas program. 
Many of you were here Thursday for the service for Kristen Lee Barrick, which was attended by many of our members and many from the uh, Community Church, United Church of Christ on Dixie Trail. It's uh, Doug Barrick's church where he's the organist. And we got word this week that uh, hospice care has been called in for Menifee Little, who remains at Mayview. Would you join with me now in time of prayer? God of all mercies, we are so grateful for Carol Ann and that she never lets us forget about her people, people we probably don't know. Our paths probably wouldn't cross, but they're real people. And when they found themselves in desperate straits, they thought and thought, who can we turn to for help? God is our only hope. And so they prayed and they looked around for your presence. And somehow by providence, or persistence, they found us. And there was some relief and renewed hope. But it's not just in the outreach office. Every day, someone here is an answer to prayer, tending to the sick and the lonely, going to those left in the lurch by a sudden loss, those who are victims, those who've had heavy burdens put on them for a long, long time. But each day, prayer is answered. Healing begins in the tenderest places. Light peeks into the deepest gloom, and that forgotten sensation of being loved begins to come back. And we realize we're not alone. We pray this morning especially for those about to face holiday traditions without one who was part of forming that tradition. May grief and lament give way to gratitude in a song of love. As we'll sing before we depart this morning, may the long expected Jesus from our fears and sins release us, helping us find our rest in him. In his spirit, we pray as those who would be disciples, praying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Yeah, thank you all so much. Yeah, you can sit down. We're going to have our little uh, children's time together, but I'm so glad to be able to thank you for that music. That was wonderful. That was some of the best sounds that have been in this room for as long as I can remember. Yeah, be careful walking around the candles there. That, um... Actually, I have a chair to sit on. I'll be right back. Those are wonderful sounds. We have, today's a day we think about another sound. Do you know what these buckets are for? Noisy offering. And I don't know if some of y'all remembered your noisy offering today. If you did, um, all right. Let me hear your noisy offering. Go ahead and dump them in here. If you don't have it, you can bring it later. That's good. Oh, what a racket that is. Any other? Just pour it all in. Uh, that's so thick it's not even coming out. There we go. They keep shaking it. My goodness. You got a lot. You keep working on that. Keep shaking it. Anybody else? He's trying. He's trying. Yeah. Okay, hold on just a minute. Let, let's try this. Let's try this way. One more time. It's sort of like a ketchup bottle in it. Just keep knocking it. There we go. All right. You got some more? Okay. Boy, y'all got a lot. Thank you so much. Just pour it right in there. That's a happy noise. Anybody else? Let me ask you a question. Why do, why do we give things like this? Why do, we, why do we give money to the church and why do we give gifts at Christmas time? Does anybody know? Yes. To help people who don't have things. That's right. And the other reason we give is we believe that God has given us so much. There's a word that we use to describe God. God is generous. God gives things. God is a giver. And if we want to be like God... We want to be generous too. We want to give. We want to give gifts. And so I know some of you are going to help me because I think the people out there want to be generous too, right? So if anybody wants to walk around, we have a few buckets. Make sure somebody goes up into the choir. Don't forget the choir. All right. There we go. That's okay. That's okay. We'll take turns. Okay. I think we're all out of buckets. Okay. Now I'm going to hold on to this one until they bring theirs back. So y'all just, y'all just sort of have a seat here and wait, we'll wait till they come back. But we give. And y'all don't need to go down every row. Just sort of go down the ends of the row. Okay, he came back with some soft money. That's uh, some quiet money. That's good. We'll do that. But if this is if this is your first time here on a noisy offering Sunday, one of the things we what we do with this offering is we support Miriam's Basket, which makes our child development center available to children who might not be able to afford it. You want to dump that right in here? If, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And I think what you're learning is it can be fun to give. Thank you so much. Well, you must have gone down a big row. That's good. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Miller, good job. Just dump it right in there. Good job. I think God likes the noisy offering. You th God loves... God loves the sound that you made when you were singing and with your chimes. And this is a happy sound for us too because this says that we are being a generous people. Wonderful, thank you. That we are being a generous people, that we are trying to be the kind of people that God wants us to be. All right. You folks are doing wonderful work. 
Boy, too much more, and I'm going to have to use both hands here. All right. <laughs> that is so good. All right. Let's pray. Let's give thanks to God for God's generosity to us. Let's pray. Can you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you that you give. Help us to give. Help us to love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. If you can just bring your buckets right over here and stack them up, and y'all can uh, head back to your seats or head out to Children's Church. Thank you for your help. Couldn't have done this without you. There you go. Let's bow our heads for the prayer for illumination. Gracious and most holy God, as we worship here together, we pray that your words will inspire and sustain us as we try to do your work here on earth. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. I read beginning with, chapter, with verse 1. Now let us hear the word of the Lord. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term and her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently leave the mother sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament reading is taken from Mark's record of the gospel where you will hear an echo of the Isaiah text. From the first chapter of Mark, beginning at the first verse, listen again to God's word for us. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. 
the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Eternal God, bless us with the gift of your spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Having been asked to reflect on a significant moment in his life, a moment which might have made a real difference in his life, a man recalled a time when having arrived in Washington, D.C. a day early for a meeting, he decided to spend a day as a tourist, to spend the day walking around the streets of the nation's capital. He'd done that before, but mostly on trips to Washington before, he had done the monument and memorial tour going from the Jefferson to the Lincoln to the Washington. But this time, he decided to get a map of the city and just wander to see the buildings, to get a feel for the city. And so that's what he did, up and down streets with which he was not familiar, into areas of the city he'd never seen, wandering this way and that, until he finally figured out he was lost. Having gone past the edge of the little map he found in the hotel lobby. So he did what men do when they're lost. He just kept walking. <laughs> hoping to see a landmark that looked familiar. Hoping to figure this out on his own. As he walked, he said he had a sense that someone was following him not far behind him. And as he turned a corner, he sort of glanced over his shoulder and got a glimpse of someone, kind of a rough-looking guy, who probably lived out on the street, dirty clothes, raggedy coat. And so he's thinking to himself, great, not only am I lost, but I bet this guy's going to try to catch up to me and ask me for a handout, or worse. He could feel his heart begin to race, his adrenaline begin to course. And sure enough, when he came to the next intersection where he had to stop because of traffic, he had to stop before crossing the street, he felt a hand on his shoulder. He couldn't believe how brazen this guy was to actually put his hand on his shoulder, and so he braced himself. Though no amount of bracing could have prepared him for what came next. Sir, he said, you don't want to go down that street. You're heading into a pretty dangerous area. What you need to do is turn around and go three blocks and then take a left and then stay on that street for a while and you'll get back to the main part of the city. And with that, the disheveled stranger was on his way. Now looking back at that odd and unexpected encounter, the man said he had no idea what sort of peril he avoided by not going down the street. He had no way of knowing what sort of peril he avoided, all because a poorly dressed, raggedy looking stranger advised him to turn around. Almost every year when we are anxious and eager to celebrate the birth of Jesus, we meet our very own poorly dressed, raggedy looking stranger who invites us to turn around. For almost every year during the early days of Advent, when all we want to do is get to Bethlehem, the lectionary insists that we make our way out into the wilderness. 
where we run into John the Baptist, who seems to have but one sermon to preach. Repent. Turn around. Which is basically what the guy on the Washington, D.C. street corner said to the man who had no idea where he was. He put his hand on his shoulder and said, you don't want to keep going the direction you're going. You don't want to stay on this same road. You're going to want to turn around. You want to turn around and go another way. In both cases, it's a call to repentance. To stop going in a direction that will take you farther and farther from where you want to be. And to turn around. To begin moving in a direction where your life can abound. Now the modern thinking about preaching is that people don't like to be told to repent. They don't like to be reminded that they're going in the wrong direction. What modern people want, we're told, is to be affirmed, soothed, encouraged, or even entertained. But according to our text for today, people were coming out to hear John in droves. More than likely, it's a little bit of biblical hyperbole, but it says that all the people were going out to him and were baptized by him. All the people of Jerusalem, it says, were going out to him to be baptized by him, confessing their sins. John's message, it seemed, had tapped into something that was deeply rooted in their hearts. A deep awareness that I'm not living the life that I was intended to live. That I'm not living the life that God wants me to live. I'm not even living the life that I want to live. John's message of repentance tapped into this deep sense of uneasiness. This awareness that there is a disconnect between how I am living and how I'm supposed to be living. So while people might be drawn to the uh, message of the power of positive thinking or to soothing words of encouragement, at some point along the way, most people know they need to have a John the Baptist in their lives. Someone who will tell them, you need to turn around. But when John calls people to repent for their sins, I really think he's doing more than telling them to behave themselves. The Greek word that is generally translated sin in the New Testament is hamartia, which literally means missing the mark. Like missing the bullseye, like coming up short of a goal, maybe even missing the point of something. Sin, then, in the New Testament is about more than the bad, selfish, petty, thoughtless things we do. Sin is about a life being lived on the wrong track or on the wrong road. And it stands to reason if you stay on the wrong track for too long, you'll wind up in places you don't want to go. Sin, then, is a word used to describe a life lived in the wrong direction, guided by the wrong principles, following the wrong path. The word sin in Scripture is a word bigger than the individual bad things I do. It's really more about a life lived with the wrong agenda, the wrong ambitions, with the wrong things at the center. So John here doesn't give a list of the sins that are causing people to miss the mark but because he assumes they already know. Just as we know. We know, don't we, if we take an honest look at our lives where we are missing the mark. We know, don't we, where our lives are out of kilter, off track. We know, don't we, <clears throat> where our own lives bear little resemblance to the life of Jesus. That's why we look at these texts in Advent, by the way, because we're about to celebrate the birth of one who lived a life of perfect devotion to God and neighbor, one who called us to follow him, to become his disciples, his apprentices, so that our lives would begin to match 
His so that we would love what He loved, do what He would do, live the way He lived. And I think we know where we fall short. For some of us, we are guided more by personal ambition than by love for neighbor. For some of us, hard to shake prejudices keep us from seeing people the way Jesus saw them. For some of us, our incapacity to forgive keeps us from enjoying healthy relationships. For some of us, our prayer life is so thin that we have no deep connection to God. For some of us, our unwillingness to live sacrificially keeps us from knowing the full joy of faith. For some of us, our spirit of envy crowds out our capacity for thanksgiving. Maybe I should stop there. Maybe like John, I shouldn't even come up with a list like that because if you don't hear your particular weakness on that list, you might think John's call to repentance doesn't apply to you. But I bet it does, just as I know it applies to me. John's call to repentance, which was echoed in Jesus' very first sermon later in this same chapter, is a call to recognize that if we are on a path that is taking us farther and farther from the life to which we're called, we should turn around and begin living in a new direction, guided by the long-awaited Messiah whose birth we celebrate year after year. But of course, the great good news of the gospel is that rather than us, by our best efforts, making our way to Jesus as if we could, Jesus has made his way to us. That's what we celebrate when we say that in the incarnation of Jesus, God has come to where we are, met us where we are, seen us as we are, and has loved us anyway. Some of you know the publication, The Christian Century. It's a publication that lots of folks read. Right now, they are inviting people to see if they can summarize the Christian gospel in seven words and then to submit those seven-word gospels on their website. It's amazing what you can say in seven words. I haven't submitted anything, but if I did, it would be this. God knows us and loves us anyway. God knows us and loves us anyway. You see, the people who were drawn to John the Baptist were drawn to him not just because he was going to point out their sinfulness. They could have stayed home and pondered their sinfulness. But what John suggested was that forgiveness was possible. The Pharisees, for example, didn't talk much about forgiveness. With them, it was all about keeping the law. Keep it to the letter and you're in. Mess up and you're out. There's no gospel in that. But our text says that John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John wasn't just pointing out their flaws. John's not just pointing out our flaws. He was inviting them and inviting us to believe that a fresh start is possible. That new ways of living are possible because forgiveness is possible. The people of Jerusalem came out in droves to hear John the Baptist because that sounded like good news to them. Because it is. It is. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
Let us say together what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and what is ours to give as we receive our morning offering. Oh, 
It has been suggested by some that before the Christian gospel sounds like good news, it first sounds like bad news because it in invites us to acknowledge the truth about ourselves. But until we understand our own brokenness and flaws, we don't fully understand the depth of God's love for us and the power of the grace to shape and change who we are. So hear that good news that in Christ we are made whole and complete that we might live not for our glory, but for His. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those you love and God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen.